God bless you. This is Rosemary Santiago from On Wings of an Eagle. I know it looked like I had flown the coop, but there were many things that were taking place. But praise God, we are here. Let's start the program with prayer. Father, we give you thanks, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the victory that you gave our household, Lord. All this business with the COVID and oh my goodness, what didn't happen? But one thing I know for sure, Lord, we felt your presence. We felt your mercy. We felt your love, Lord, and you helped us conquer it. You gave us victory over all these things. Now I ask, Lord, victory for those who will be listening, Lord. Open up the minds, Lord, that they may receive this word, that they may understand. We are in the end times and we need to know the truth. Truth is going to be something like a treasure in these times of deception. I ask you these things in Jesus' mighty name. So we're going to have a little bit of everything. I'm going to start with something that's going to sound a little bit off, but you're going to see the connection with that little piece and everything else that's going to be spoken about because it's time for the church to wake up to the truth, to the things that are going to be taking place. So I'm going to start uh, with this uh, information. It says the cutting down of the tree has significant meaning. This signifies the premature death of Tammuz. As a part of this custom, the people would cry and mourn for Tammuz. So I looked at uh, Ezekiel 8.14, and it says, In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. So you're going to start seeing the connection of all this paganism all the way up until this time. While I was looking for information, uh, everyone that was going to have their, um, you know, show their information to whomever wanted to go into uh, Google were already defending Ishtar's name. No, that's not Easter. Let's see if that's true, because we're going to go step by step. Okay, so it says Semiramis, which is the culprit of all these feminine deities, goddesses, or whatever you want to call them, is known by many names around the world. Some of these names include Mother of God. Have you heard that phrase before? Mother of God. Ishtar, which is Easter, whether those want to believe it or not. Ashtoreth, Ashtart, Ashtoreth, Ashtart, Asherah, Inanna, and Isis. And you have no idea how many more names there are. She is the goddess of fertility, love, war, sex, and power. Her symbols include eggs, owls, Fish, doves, pole, which is a tree stump, and the star, number one. Usually the eight-pointed star. In the, in the Bible, she is described as the queen of heaven. Have you heard that title before? Queen of heaven. The worship of her was something that the God of the Hebrews, Yehovah, hated. We're going to see... Uh, uh, the illustration number two. And you will notice that in here with the sun rays, that would be seven, seven areas and the seven point, uh, uh, pointed stop, excuse me, the eight pointed star and the eight rays make up the 16 pointed star. And by the way, those two stars that my son showed are from Iraq. That's their symbol in their flag. And then you question names like Isis and all these things. And we're going to go on. Sacred feminines. Sacred according to the people. 
ancient history, Old Testament, Semiramis, Tammuz, Babylonian religion. You have Ishtar, Babylonia, see? Easter, Ishtar. Tara, Buddhism. Fatima, that's the way they pronounce Fatima. Uh, Mohammedism. Sophia, Gnosticism. Shakina, Kabbalism. Shakti, Hinduism. Mary, Catholicism. And all these sacred feminine, they are taking you back to the source of light. His real name is Halel. That's the way it, they, uh, uh, star of the dawn, dawn of the morning and all that, uh, uh, title is actually Lucifer, which is the, uh, the Vulgate, Latin Vulgate, uh, uh, interpretation which really was referring to Venus, the planet. So they take you back to the light bearer. I don't want to be uh, back with that light bearer. I'd rather have the Lord who is the, the light of the world. Culture, Semiramis, Nimrod, Babylonia. You have Isis, Osiris, that is the, uh, the husband, wife, Egypt. You have... Asterid, Baal, that's Phoenicia. Aphrodite, Adonis, Eros, which is erotic. That's where the word erotic comes from, Greece. Venus, Cupid, it's from Rome. We know of Cupid, right? Uh, Valentine's Day. Zoroaster, Cupid, also the name Cupid, Far East. Seed of Asterid or Easter. Ishtar, Tammuz, Isis, Osiris, symbol of crescent moon and the sun is supposed to be the husband. Okay, we have three illustrations. One uh, uh, would be number two, a lamination of Ishtar. I'm sorry, I should say number three. My fault. Okay, I was going to read a lot of information on it, but it would take up too much time. Then we have the fourth illustration, the bare-breasted fertility god of the east. And that equals to sunrise. You're going to see how important sunrise is. And number four, which is Aphrodite. I'm sorry, number five, it's my fault. That's because we separated uh, the illustrations. Okay, I'm going to read from Jeremiah 7.18. I can read it off the uh, my paper. It says, The children gather wood, and the fa fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the Queen of Heaven. You see, that's a very old title and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. That's found in uh, Jeremiah 7, 18. We have Jeremiah 44, 17 to 19 and verse 25. And it says, this is where they're actually fighting in favor of Ishtar and all the other names that they gave because there's so many names that have been brought out according to the, the culture. It says, but we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven. Then they start giving like, um, like a lot of people do with all these uh, idols and their gods, their deities. They give credit where credit is not due. And it says to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done. We and our fathers, that means like where in uh, Exodus chapter 20, it says, I will visit the sin of your parents up to the third and the fourth generation. 
and they had to cut that because in other words uh as the uh, generations progress and they drag the same uh, uh creed the same religion they are sinning and they are committing blasphemy against the true the one and only god so it says um so they're going to continue to pour out the drink offerings unto her as we have done we and our fathers our kings our princes in the cities of judah and in the streets of jerusalem for then had we plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil but since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven the, you know something um that's how satan and the unclean spirits work because um, uh, many people who have left uh, the things of the world and have come to the things of the Lord, all of a sudden, you know, you, you don't know that you're being tried. If you want to talk about trial, uh, check out the Old Testament, the book of Job. You will see how God is actually flaunting him and telling the enemy, because Satan is not a name. Satan means adversary enemy and it's usually followed uh after by by the article the the satan the enemy the adversary so it says but since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine that's not what was bringing it it was their going and getting filthy in the things of the world, uh, uh, in paganism, in other creeds. So in one part, um, uh, Jeremiah the prophet brings to their uh, attention, um, since you left the things of God, this is what has been. Now you're wallowing. You know how the uh, the pigs in the pigsty, they wallow in their body products. I know because I used to raise pigs. I can talk about it. I don't care how much you clean them. You can put perfume on them and they'll go back to the wallowing. And also... There's an, uh, a part here where it says, This was preached at the mouth of the prophet, even King Solomon, it is written, followed this fertility goddess. Look at his sin. Now, after, after he had made uh, this uh, covenant with the Lord and, and he built his house, it took seven years and, and, and he did such a beautiful place. But then when he was calling Ezekiel, excuse me, he was saying, you want to see the abominations? You want to see how angry they are getting me? They are insulting me. I am the only God. I am the creator. I am the one that formed everything that has life. So it says, for Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites, First King 11.5. Anytime I give scripture, it's good for you to have your Bible and look. Now it says that Nimrod too was represented by the same symbols as his wife Semiramis. These symbols include the fish, which is the fish god, Dagon. Now we're going to see in, um, in a few weeks from now, I'm going to be doing... Uh, bringing out all the uh, pagan symbols and how it is connected to either the sun god or Dagon, the uh, the fish, the fish god. Okay. So it says when the Hebrews went after other gods, this was considered overdone. Anybody, you will notice that in the in the Word of God, uh, when he speaks about uh, a church when he speaks about uh, uh, the whore that sits 
on the on the beast talking about a whore because she is unfaithful she is uh what would you say exactly a whore. she left her true husband and went on whoring that word is in the bible by the Okay, so Nimrod and Semiramis, king and queen, Genesis 10, 8, 9, and verse 11. It, you know, uh, we have our language English. The English language is mixed with a lot of other uh, Italian, uh, uh, German words. All these things are in there. Now, when we read the word of God, we have to read and find out the definition and the precise word uh, written in Hebrew. Otherwise, you miss it. A lot of people, and uh, especially the church, has, has said for years, and we drag that, which is not true. Uh, the, the New Testament wasn't written in Greek. It was translated to Greek. There's a very big difference. So it says the word uh, mighty hunter before God. When I looked up the word, the word panim, it means see uh, each other in the face. But you know how when people are going to fight each other, right? Face to face. I looked at the uh, root word and the root word is panima. It means face forward from the point of view of one entering by an opposite door. What does it say in the New Testament about entering in the opposite door? Here is where the Lord is saying that he's the shepherd of the sheep. Chapter 10 of, of John. 10. I got to be zooming by because I really and truly want to get to what I want to get to. Okay. 10, 1. And it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold must, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. So, when, uh, when we come to the history of, of Nimrod, when we go into chapter 11 of Genesis, we're going to see that he literally defies. Now, God said that man was to spread out, was to multiply. And Nimrod said, no, I'm going to gather people and we're going to do this instead. We are going to make a name for ourselves. And you will notice that here in these times, anybody who tries to make a name for themselves, all the same ones, critters, they all get together with the same purpose to do evil things and defy be face forward against what god says and those are the same ones that we're going to be reading about in revelation some other time and i would suggest you want to do you want to find out ahead of time so you can get yourself prepared i suggest you get into the book of revelation if you don't understand, ask God, the very author of, of the Bible, to let you in on, on those things. And there are plenty of people that could really give you information. Dr. Heiser, Dr. Tom Horn, the, the crew, I call them the crew from, uh, from Skywatch. These people are no joke. These people can really be mentors when it comes to the word of God. God has used them for years. They are writers and not everybody that produce books have the, uh, uh, the, uh, the heart to, 
to kind of sway everybody. No, there are people that actually know what they're talking about. I suggest it because I've been uh, in their information and God has blessed me radically. So we have the mighty hunter. He dies and becomes deified as the sun god Baal. Legend says that Semiramis gets pregnant by the rays of the sun. We saw that in one of the symbols, the, first, uh, the second symbol, right? Of her deceased husband, Nimrod, and gives birth to Tammuz. There's a lot of incest going on in this thing because you will see some information about Nimrod and Semiramis. Semiramis is supposed to be his mother. And then you have an incestuous uh, relationship between Semiramis and Tammuz. It's, it's a whole uh, a salad of a lot of things in there. Okay, she cut his body into pieces and sent them to each tribe of Babylon. Wherever the pieces were buried, it was considered sacred. She also claimed that Nimrod was incarnated in her son, Tammuz. She reigned Babylon in place of her son. So now you, you have a, 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 a woman, a feminist during that time. And you thought feminism was created in these times. She maneuvered people to worship her. Monuments of Semiramis carrying her child were set up all over Babylon along with various images symbolizing the sun god. This woman was very controlling. The sun worship and the mother-child worship, which was a scheme devised by her, put down roots as a religion of Babylon and they say that from there stemmed all the spreading into the countries, all these names, all this worshiping. It says it is because when the Babylonians were scattered over the whole world, we have that uh, where God literally comes down and confuses, right? And by the way, not that there were no languages before, because if you read real good chapter 9 and 10, you will see that they had different languages, but that's not the language that, that, that God uh, uh, was getting at, even though they ended up being uh, not understanding one, one another. But the language that, would, that he was really getting at is when everybody gets into one mind and have a purpose, an evil purpose, that's the language that he really wanted to get. That's why he caused the confusion. That's why they couldn't understand each other so that if there was language already, he made more languages that were never spoken of. Therefore, being assimilated into the cultures and religions of many countries, and they came to various forms. You have sun god worship, which is the male, right? And mother-child worship. You have Nimrod, Semiramis, Tammuz, Babylonia. You have Mithra in Persia. Sol, we say Sol in Spanish. Diana and Attis in Rome. Ra and Horus. Isis and Horus, Egypt, Apollo, Venus and Dionysus, Greece, Astra and Tammuz in Israel. Okay, here we go with another incest. Tammuz's incestuous relationship with his mother brings the idea of Cupid. Where have we heard the name Cupid? Right, Valentine's Day. For 40 years, he was a mighty hunter. Also like his dad, right? Like father, like son. Tammuz was killed by a wild boar. So every year in commemoration of his death and the deification of Tammuz, who became the son of God, Nimrod, the sun god, 40 days would be set aside prior to Ishtar Sunday, 
It's not any other name. It's Easter Sunday. Sun worship. Easter. Easter. And they would fast and pray and have a giant feast on the first Sunday where they would celebrate the death and resurrection of Tammuz. That's what the dinner was. Easter ham. Do you know how many people in Easter actually uh, roast a ham? You know, with, with those uh, cloves and the pineapple and everything. But we're still seeing the product of this. Okay, every spring, the first Sunday after spring equinox, they would celebrate Easter Sunday. At the sunrise service, the priest of Ishtar would impregnate a virgin at the altar. When the child would reach three months old, it would be sacrificed and they would take eggs of Ishtar and dip into the baby's blood. Could you do number six? They would impregnate a virgin at the sunrise service, the priest of Ishtar. And right in the altar would impregnate that virgin. And when the baby would reach three months old, as you see in the illustration, they would dip the eggs, the Easter eggs or the Easter eggs into the blood of the sacrificed infant and dip into the baby's blood. Now, worldwide Easter eggs are red. The main ones in the White House, the official color of the White House Easter egg is red. Gee, I wonder if they know this. Okay, sunrise. The idea of a day beginning at sunset does not appear until the Babylonian exile. Remember, they were in exile. The Jewish people were in exile. There was a, uh, a going into exile, coming out of exile. Then the, the next group, it lasted exactly 70 years before they were completely uh restored if you could use that that word so now we're going to get into something very interesting um i could read it either from here or i could read it from the word of god it's still i'm going to uh starting with 12 16 and exodus Okay, it says, in the first month, on the 14th day of the month at twilight, when God says a new day begins, is Yehovah's castle. Then on the 15th day of the same month, there is the feast of unleavened bread to Yehovah for seven days. You shall eat unleavened bread. Now, let's get something straight. Passover is actually the meal. But the feast is the unleavened bread. That's what it starts. It says, on the first day, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. This factor is very important when we get to the New Testament. Because certain things were happening uh, between the time that the Lord is in uh, uh, the uh, the cross and all this other things uh, taking place where where uh, things had to stop because of it or you had to rush something because of it, and we will get there. So it says. On the first day, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. But for seven days, it had to last seven days. They couldn't break it. 
You shall present an offering by fire to Jehovah. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. You will find that. You can read it for yourself in Leviticus 23, 5 to 8. So we have the passage tells us that the Passover, the cedar, is called the cedar. That's the dinner. Is on the 14th. The Feast of Unleavened Bread begins on the 15th. They are back to back. The first day and the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is also called a High Sabbath, which has been, uh, how would you say, mistaken for the Sabbath, which is Saturday. We call it Saturday, right? Yeshua had to be removed from the cross the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, not the weekly Sabbath. This is going to get very interesting, and I'm going to go step by step. What happened? What happened was that I was very curious. I've been curious about this and looking uh, and dwelling and being like the, uh, like the deep sea diver for years because something was uh, wrong, something that I couldn't put at that moment my finger on. And I said, but it doesn't say that he resurrected on Sunday, on the first day of the week. It says the women went to bring the spices. And you don't bring spices from the store like that. You have to prepare it. It takes days and you cannot do work on a certain day because that's exactly what we read on uh, Leviticus, right? So, okay, we're going to start. Passover cedar is not a Sabbath. It is a day of preparation for the high Sabbath, the first day of the seventh day feast of unleavened bread. Okay, so we have Tuesday night. Passover cedar meal. We have the prayer in Gethsemane. We have the Lord being arrested and brought before the Jews. So let me read. Now the first day of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying unto him, where will thou be? Pre we prepare for thee to eat the Passover cedar. Remember, it's not a feast. It is the preparation for the uh, feast of unleavened bread. So he says, and he said, go into the city to such a man and say unto him, the master saith, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. You'll find that in Matthew 26, 17 to 19. Okay, the last Passover cedar, the meal. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as he did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had never been born. Then Judas, and this is not where everybody knew that it was him, because the Lord was not like that. Eventually, he, came, he comes next to, to the Lord and says, Is it I? He said unto him, thou hast said, that you find in Matthew 26, verse 20 to 25. Now comes the Lord's Supper instituted. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it. 
and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the new Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the, into the Mount of Olives. That's in Matthew 26, 26 to 30. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, or Gethsemane, they say, and saith unto the disciples, sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. Mind you, he's not saying just sit around and do nothing. He's going to invite them so that they can pray because there is nothing worse than one person going through so much, so much emotional battle and be alone or feel alone or be the victim of uh, Job's best friends while he was going through what he was going through. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. I got that from another one also. And he said to his disciples, sit ye here while I pray. Matthew 26, 36. Wednesday morning. We were talking about Tuesday. Before Pilate. On the cross by 9 and dead by 3 p.m. We have... Uh, the most awesome information in Exodus chapter 12, where it tells you, here, I'll read it because I'm here already, trying to kind of save time, where it says, see? Okay. It says between two uh, evenings. I have a problem like with the English version because in the Spanish it's very specific where it says uh, uh, entre dos tardes, which means it's exactly from 12, 12 to 3. Um, and it says, and they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. That you will find in Matthew 27, 35. Then it says here, this is where it says in, uh, in the uh, gospel. It says, now from the sixth hour which is 12 there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour i heard uh this morning something said that really the five miracles that took place when when all this was was happening the first miracle is that very one it's almost like the brother said I, I don't remember the name, uh, but it was an amazing video. And uh, he said, it's like if the Lord says, you do not accept the God light of this world. Well, I'm going to give you the opposite of light, which was the darkness. And it hovered over for three hours exactly. So it says the Jews, therefore... Because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath. And talking about the high Sabbath. For that Sabbath day was a high day. So we're talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread and not a Saturday that we call Saturday. Besought Pilate. 
that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So I put feast of unleavened bread equals the high Sabbath. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with him. Mind you, we're not talking about Jesus in the middle, two, two thieves on each end, and there was nobody around. Because it says that they, they were even being, uh, the Lord was even being mocked by those that were crucified. Now, one of them did not mock, so we are looking at a panorama of more people that have, had been crucified that day. Uh, nobody, especially the Romans, they wouldn't take out three people and, and just do their thing for three people. Believe me, if you look into history, you'll know what I'm talking about. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And also, uh, this is in the uh, Old Testament. Uh, he keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. That's found in Psalm 34, 20. And again, another scripture said, uh, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Uh, that's found in John 19, 31, 37. But it also shows um, in Zechariah 12, 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced very prophetic and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn zechariah 12 10 and by the way it's in zechariah chapter 14 where he literally comes down and it divides in two sections and a lot of activity is going to go on so now we're in Wednesday night. Now, Wednesday during the day. Was where he's brought to Pilate. Uh, already the, he was already examined by the Pharisees. He was uh, spoken against. Uh, all the, uh, the, I think there's a book called 18... 18 uh, laws broken on the night of, of his, uh, his trial. So now we're talking about, uh, they had already put him in, but quickly. He wasn't totally prepared. He just had a, a, a particular place, which you will see. So Wednesday night, Yeshua was already in the tomb. The first night of high Sabbath begins. Thursday, Yeshua in the tomb. That's the first day of the, of the Sabbath. It says the first day. Thursday night, Yeshua is still in the tomb. That's the second night. And that's the end of the high Sabbath. So we have from Wednesday night to Thursday night, which is 24 hours exactly. Friday, Yeshua is in the tomb. Second day, spices bought and prepared. So we have John 19, 38 to 42. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first 
came to Jesus by night, letting you know in John chapter 3 is where the Lord tells him the famous, uh, you must be born again and answer, this is how am I going to go back to my mother's womb kind of thing. And brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes about a hundred pound weight. They then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen, in linen clothes with the spices as a manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And here's all the little, the little puzzles that, that go together because since they couldn't, they had only a certain amount of time. They could only do but so much. So all they did was this. There laid they, Jesus, before, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. It was near. So what they did is the best way that they could do that. And you'll find that in John chapter 19, 38, 42. The only way that they can do that is it had to be near. It was never used by anyone because it's prophetic. It's in the Old Testament where it says that he was uh, 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 put into, uh, 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 what would you call that? A tomb of the rich. And you understand that, right? That, that, that uh, uh, Joseph of Ar Arimathea was, was also a principal in that in the Sanhedrin. That's why he was afraid. And uh, he hid the fact that he was a follower. It doesn't say the same for Nicodemus. Okay, so now we have Friday night, Yeshua in the tomb. Third night, weekly Sabbath begins. Now we're talking about the weekly Sabbath. We're not talking about, right? So Thursday night to Friday night is another 24 hours. 24 times 2 is 48. Saturday, Saturday during the day, Yeshua in the tomb, third day, weekly Sabbath, Friday night to Saturday night, we're talking about our 24 hours according, according to the Feast of the Unleavened, according to what a weekly Sabbath the difference between the weekly Sabbath and the high Sabbath, which is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So from Friday night to Saturday night is another 24 hours. That is exactly, exactly three days and three nights. That's how it was divided. So now, Saturday night, Yeshua is not in the tomb. End of weekly Sabbath. It says Yeshua died on Passover, but was removed from the cross before sunset. Here I'm going to give the, uh, the, the sequences. Which began the high Sabbath, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And Joseph brought a linen cloth, took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out in the rock and he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb mark 15 46 because of the approaching high sabbath the linen wrapping was all that time allowed to be done for yeshua under the torah one could not buy or sell on a sabbath I read that from the very beginning in Leviticus. And if the people of the land bring ware or any victuals on the Sabbath day to sell, this is when uh, now the, uh, the, uh, the Israelites was saying, we understand this is what we're going to do. We understand that we can't do this. But then when you keep reading on, you'll see all the other things that they had done. It said that we would not buy it of them on the Sabbath 
or on the holy day and that we would leave the seventh year and the exaction of every debt that's found in nehemiah 10 31 therefore the women could not obtain the necessary items to properly anoint his body and bury Yeshua. However, once the high Sabbath was over, talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the women could buy what they needed for this task. Now, the preparation of the spices... On the day after the high Sabbath, the women purchased the spices and spent the day preparing them to anoint Yeshua's body. And I'm talking about the high Sabbath. High Sabbath, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. However, they were once again delayed this time by the weekly Sabbath. They went, they prepared, they were allowed to, right? And that day was the preparation. And the Sabbath drew on. And the women also, which came with him from Galilee, followed after and beheld the sepulcher and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath Day according to the commandment. That's found in Luke 23, 54, 56. They were tossed between all this that was uh, taking place. So it says, now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the sp spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. That's what took place Sunday morning. Okay? Sunday morning. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. He had resurrected on uh sabbath night according to the division of how they were going to do the uh the cedar the uh feast of uh unleavened bread the weekly sabbath which is different from the high sabbath Okay, and it says, and it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you. When he was yet in Galilee, you find that in Luke 24, 1, 6, where Luke 23, 54, 56, it says, and they return and prepare spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day. That's the weekly Sabbath. And it's the day. But you know, when the Lord spoke, he said he compared his three days and three nights with uh, with Jonah. He said, just like he was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. That's exactly how the Son of Man, because they were looking for signs and they were tired of seeing signs. And he said, the only sign that you got to worry about is this one. The Son of Man. It's three days and three nights. That makes 72 hours. If you multiply 24 times three, you'll get 72 hours. So, Yeshua died. 
place in a tomb as the high Sabbath of the first day of the feast of unleavened bread began. The women were forced to wait for that evening and day to pass. The next morning after the Sabbath, when the shops were open, that is unleavened bread. Feast of unleavened bread, the high Sabbath. Um, the next morning after the Sabbath, when the shops were open, they purchased the spices and prepared them to anoint Yeshua's body. They then had to rest for the weekly Sabbath to pass. They waited until morning on the first day of the week, Sunday, to go to the tomb to prepare his body. When they arrived, the tomb was empty because he had already risen. And then it says to fulfill Yeshua's word of three days and three nights in the earth sometime before sunset and the end of Saturday, Yeshua arose. Let me look at this. Matthew 1240. Matthew 1240. Okay. Here's what I was saying. Let me start with 38 so you can get a look at how people are. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered saying, Master, we, we would see a sign from thee. They saw multitudes of signs all over but he answered and said unto them an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet jonas for as jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And that, my brothers and sisters, and those that may have been uh, uh, watching and listening, unfortunately, a lot of the wrong interpretations have dragged. And now we see that uh, he did not. He, now we see the connection of the sunrise and what really takes place and why it takes place has nothing to do with the Lord uh, resurrecting. Uh, he has always been been the lord the god of the sabbath and it's a shame because now that we are in the the in spanish we call it a cuspide you know like when you get to the very top of a mountain the peak we are at the peak of deception and now what for so long looked like the truth now we're starting to understand the rebellion of Satan, Adam and Eve. Then we have uh, not so much the rebellion of the people. They had already started with Adam and Eve sinning with such a promise of, of being uh, 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 made in his image and likeness. Thank God that he had, uh, the father had already arranged. It was predestined. He knew what was going to happen because he is God. He is all-knowing. He's the real all-knowing God. Then we have uh, where the Lord puts charge to the angels, certain angels, and then he rebelled. This is not even the other ones that rebelled and went along with Satan. This is another, the, the rebellion before that were the watchers. 
They were supposed to put watch over, not not watch lusty over females of the humans. Then chapter 11, then those rebelled. Then they took over. You don't believe it? Psalm 82 explains it. And I'm telling you, this is the time where people who want to look for God, they are getting eye-openers with the word, amazing truth of the word of God. And then it goes all the way and all that spreading, spreading of, of, of deities, female, male, and all these things that we are seeing now, when the Lord said it's going to be like the times, like the days of Noah, and like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, you must be blind if you can't see that. Because what seems to be something new, like the contamination, transhuman, all this kind of stuff, that's old news. There is nothing new under the sun. And when you start knowing from the very beginning all the things that were taking place, you're going to find out that a book that was kept apart purposely, I say, <laughs> because up until the second uh, temple, the Jews believed it. It's the book of Enoch. And if it's so, uh, how would you say, if it's an apocrypha, if it's, if it's not even canonized like we say what's their men mention of the uh of enoch in uh second peter second peter in uh in the book of, of jude only one chapter is got verses got powerful verses they come out of the page they're so powerful well, why is it that we're seeing evidence that has been so uh, poorly hidden because God exposes everything? This is the time of truth. Church, it is time for us to connect like those bones that connected through the Holy Spirit. This is time. There's no more dilly-dallying. No time for that. We really have to eat words. We really, in fact, this is the time where God is going to raise up certain human army and he's going to show his glory here on earth before the rapture because we need for the church and we need people. There has to be a revival. You don't revive something that is alive you revive something that is dead and the real awakening is not what they're talking about in this paganistic and esoterical and you know mysticism and no no that's not the real awakening the real awakening is going to be seen when people are going to be healed people are going to uh ask god for forgiveness because there's definitely, there has to be a harvest. That's a law. And God said it. And since he spoke it, it became law. So I'm going to leave it at this. I praise God. In between all the struggle that everyone here, my family was going through. I can flaunt who God is in my life because I was able to do just about just about six different programs on paper that's the God that I serve he's almighty God omniscient omnipotent and omnipresent God and this is the one that I'm introducing you to this is the time the right time tomorrow's not promised not even to me did I know that I was going to have COVID? I had no idea. Fought it right in my room. This one here that went through so much because I have so many other conditions and here I am. I praise God. And this is the one I want you to know personally. He is a very personal father, more than what you know. So I want to lead you to the most important thing in your life, 
the most important decision in your life to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And it is so simple, very simple words, but it has to come really from your heart. And I will lead you right now. All you have to do is this. God, I have sinned greatly against you. I ask for your forgiveness. I need help. I need help every single day of my life. I need help from you. I know nothing of who you are. I accept that sin sacrifice of your son. And I ask guidance from your Holy Spirit. Guide me to the truth of your word and that you may write my name in the book of life. I ask you these things with all my heart and soul. Amen. Father, I glorify you. You're an awesome God. I ask you, Lord, that you may glorify yourself in their personal lives, their families, their needs, Lord, whether spiritually, emotionally, physically, financially, and socially, Lord. With all that's going on, Father, separated from you, we can't do a thing, Father. So I ask you these things with confidence, Lord. And I give you thanks, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. This has been Rosemary Santiago from Wings of an Eagle. Please do yourself the greatest favor in the whole world. Ask God. Ask God to lead you to the place that you will be taught the word of God. No adulteress, no mixing no, nothing that is opposite of what the Word of God is. The Holy Spirit inspired it, so you can't go wrong. God bless you.